So good morning, everyone, and welcome again to the FKI's Machine Learning Coffee Seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce you today, today's speaker, Professor Roderick Moore-Smith, who comes from the University of Glasgow, and he will be talking about variational inference for computational inversion, a CVA-based forward and inverse models for inferring human action. And as always, you are very welcome to ask your questions already during the presentation, and, and then after the presentation, we will have some time to, to further discuss us. But please, Roderick, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's uh, always a pleasure to be in Helsinki, and uh, I am actually physically here, even though this is an online session. So, um, And thanks uh, to the Finnish uh, Centre for AI for supporting the visit um, here. As I say, I'll be here, I'm here for a month at the moment, and then I'll be back in May and June, so there's opportunities to collaborate if anything that we're talking about interests you. And I just want to highlight that the techniques, um, the Vici techniques that I'm talking about in this lecture were the core of Francesco Tonnellini's thesis where he developed um, the techniques and we've been applying them in different areas. Okay, so um, just give me my, oops. So, I'm the head of the Inference Dynamics and Interaction Group in the University of Glasgow, and we're applying computational methods and machine learning to a variety of interaction techniques, but also non-HCI topics like closed loop data science and some generic machine learning and science work. And some of these things have been coming together and what you're going to be hearing today. So what the focus of the main applications in today's um, talk are about how do we go about inferring human intent from um, input devices? So if you think about the, the process of interacting with a computer, you have a, a person having a thought, having some intention, and with our current interfaces, they have to convert this into physical activity. So they move an arm or they nod a head or they walk somewhere. This is picked up by the sensor space um, and then that gets processed and mapped into some interaction control space. So when you're doing that, there's a, a simple initial condition, something is happening in your brain, that gets expanded into um, activity spread out over time. It gets sensed, often by very high dimensional sensors, so we get noisy correlated signals that relate to the physical activity, that relate to the mental activity. And then we have to try and untangle all this complexity by learning the meaningful variations in our sensor data and bring that back down to a, a low dimensional space that we can actually build something in an interactive system around. So we've got the this whole um, span from simple intention, complicated um, physical and sensing activity and embedding down to a simplified space again. In today's talk, we're going to be focusing on the, the bit of this process from the physical space to the sensor space and then bringing it down to a simple pose model. But it's important to see the broader context. So we're going to be looking at splitting up this inference of um, human activity into a forward process. So we're saying you've got some hypothesized human body pose and we then say, if you were in that pose, what would we expect to sense? So you've then got um, the potential to model the process of um, how that pose is mapped into the sensor characteristics. The inverse of approach is you take the sensor data and you try and estimate the pose from that. And this is a standard approach that's used in lots of areas of science, you know, so astronomy, um, does a lot of its uh, signal processing with this approach. Seismology is based around similar approaches. So we wanted to see what could we do in interaction. Okay, so let's look at the process of using inverse methods. You imagine you've got some clean signal. So here we've got a clean image, but then it's viewed through some obscuring medium. You've then got sensor characteristics that uh, see that. And we end up with some sort of a noisy image. So that's our forward model. If we want to do the inverse, we would like to 
uh, get back to the original image from that noisy process as, as well as we can. So we could view that as a, a standard machine learning regression problem. I know the Y and the X have been flipped around because of the Y being the output from the um, forward model. And um, so the idea is that you would then say, okay, given all these noisy images, can we train it to generate a clean image from that? So we're trying to find a manifold that would do that. We can uh, take a probabilistic approach. So you could start with Bayes rule. Um, you're going to assume that your images, uh, your clean images, the truth is in some prior distribution P of X. You sample that to get some data. And um, so you've got your, your training data, nice and clean. Um, and we're trying to now map via the forward model, uh, P of Y given X um, and sample. So we now observe a noisy image. So we're now trying to find the uh, probability of X given Y, the inverse posterior model. So you're going to be trying to um, find an approximate distribution, R theta of X of Y. That's going to be typically represented by, oops, um, by a, uh, okay. It's going to be represented by a neural network, and we're going to try and go back from the observations to the original space. And so we're going to be getting a, an R theta network to um, try and emulate the unknown prompt P of X given Y. And we're going to try and get that to do a good job on all the examples that we've got in our training data. Um, so we're, we're doing that by minimizing the cross entropy between uh, P of X given Y and R theta of X given Y. Okay, so we're getting clean training data, looking at the forward model, sampling that, getting back to the original space. So we end up with a framework like this, where we've got our noisy informations, we've got neural networks given as our, our theta function in the latent space Z. Um, and then we're going from that Z, and because we're also giving it um, some access to the noisy information, um, we then make a prediction of the, the clean data, and we can feed that back in via our, an observation model, the forward model, to compare with the, the training data. So we've got this full circle. And this is essentially like a, a variational autocoder encoder. Um, it's a contextual one because we're also feeding the raw input in. But our Z is the area here. We've got a normal distribution with a mean and a, a sigma encoded. So just going back to the previous image, the Z here is the bottleneck layer in the variational autoencoder. Okay, so let's look at what we've got so far. What we're doing is a forward model where we're going from um, the truth, the experimental targets to what we observe. And we're using a variational inference model to learn that. One thing that we're doing to try and make this easier is we're including a simplified simulation model. So this is, uh, the idea is that often we have some physical insight into a problem and we can use that to try and give the network a, a kickstart. So you could argue that this network is a kind of residual model. Uh, it's explaining the things that the physical model couldn't do. So for example, in an imaging one, we might think that our system is blurring the data a bit, and we might just include a simple blurring model. And that can be run analytically. So this isn't something that's being learned. It's um, prior knowledge. And that gives us the Y tilde, which we feed into our network as the context for the variational autoencoder. Okay, so we build a forward model, which is a combination of first principles models and um, learning from data. And the goal is that we want to, by using the simulation model, reduce the amount of experimental data we need because that's often time consuming or expensive to gather. We can then take this multi-fidelity model and use it to train an inverse model. So here we can feed in lots of clean images um, and then generate what we think they would uh, look like in our forward process. 
and then train a model um, to bring that back to X. So you could argue that what we're doing is a, a fancy way of um, augmenting the data. So you know, in, in image processing, you quite often would add rotations or add a bit of Gaussian noise to a, a classifier. Here, we're using our learned forward model to augment the training data um, to help make it easier to invert the problem. And that's interesting in inverse problems because quite often it's more straightforward to build a forward model than an inverse model. Um, high frequency elements are often being um, thrown away in the forward sensing process and so that makes the inverse process more difficult to, to learn. So getting a good forward model is often more feasible in a machine learning sense than the inverse one. So anything you can do to enhance the amount of data available for the inverse is useful. And then once you get a new observation that you're trying to work with. So here's a noisy image coming in. The model that we trained here in B can be used in C to generate possible reconstructions of that image. And just showing the, the guts, so this is the same structure as we saw in the upper figure here in A, and now just showing the different component networks. Um, Omega here is what we were using as Z before, sorry for the change in notation. But here's your prior knowledge that gives you the best guess the physics that you know it has. You then combine that with the actual data, generate a latent space, and um, uh, then you use that along with the context to try and predict the real data. And um, in the learning, you've got your um, uh, Q function here, generate, trying to predict the omega as well. So, um, let's see. Okay, and that's basically what we were seeing earlier, but with a bit more detail on the, the same sort of autoencoder structure in the inverse model. And this is your forward model from the previous setting. Okay, so here's an example of this being used in practice. We've got some images and they've been blurred to different levels with different amounts of noise added. And we can see the recovered mean when we try and predict the, um, so this is taking this information and generating this as a prediction. And what's nice is because you're sampling, you can also get the uncertainty of your prediction. So that's an important element. So you can see that when there's little noise and little blurring, we get a very good representation of the original image and we don't get much variation. But as we get more blurring, more noise, then there's more uncertainty. Um, and we can see how well it's capturing the detail. So we can draw samples from this posterior. And as you'd expect when there's little variation, they're all the same in the cases where you haven't had much noise. But as the noise levels increase, um, there's much less information here to work with. And so we see many different types of faces. But that's also good because you could show somebody, uh, you know, we can infer something, we've got a mean that looks like a face, but actually they could be all sorts of different faces. These are all compatible with this data. Okay, so here's a, a practical example I mentioned earlier that we've been doing a lot of work with um, machine learning and science. So this is uh, work with our physics colleagues. And we've got uh, target objects in this case, hidden between two, two and a half centimeter thick slabs of diffusing material. So the absorption and scattering properties are comparable to that of biological tissue. So this is kind of aimed at uh, how much could we use light to see inside the body and to track what's going on. So you illuminate one side with a pulsed laser and the opposite side with a, a time of flight camera. So you're timing photons from the laser to the camera. Um, and then the sort of images we get look like this on the, the left and we, could have, we can have a video where we see this over time. So looking at that, you'd think it's gonna be pretty hard to make much sense of that to get uh, anything out. Um, but I'll show you what happens if you apply the, the methods I've just described. So here we've got the objects that were hidden on the left. Oops. So um, they were put in with um, duct tape 
So uh, that's um, giving you a sense of the simple objects. These are the images that were sensed. The previous state of the art of trying to um, solve this um, with inverse methods is shown in this column. And this is what we managed to get um, from these images, um, along with the standard deviation and some samples from this. The prior knowledge this one was trained on was MNIST, so that's why the results look a little bit more cursive, more handwritten than the original duct tape. So the prior was not necessarily a perfect uh, match, but it's still impressive to see how much better the, the performance is than the previously published state of the art um, in, in a nature physics paper, I think. Um, okay. So the, the things that we've been focusing on more recently. I'll talk about some work we've been doing with Google with their Soli radar and some work with an unknown um, or unlabeled um, telephone, mobile telephone company that was working on a capacitive sensor for a touchscreen that would sense up to five centimeters and more from the, um, from the screen. And in each case, we're trying to understand what the hand pose was. Uh, okay. Let's see a little animation of the, uh, the radar data and the hand moving. That's part of what we'll be looking at. Okay, so on the capacitive sensing side, we had a prototype screen um, that could sample at 120 hertz. We had 10 by 16 pads, and you can see um, how the physical sensor response would change as you moved away from the screen and uh, um, a simulation of that. Yeah, so here we see that in a bit more detail. So we're interested in different ways of solving this. We can create a, a simple inverse model that does a regression, or you could have a forward model that um, tries to take a pose and position and predict the, the sensor space. And the method we're looking at is going to try and combine these. Okay, so how did we get training data? There were different approaches we'd looked at. We'd initially, with the company involved, used a, a robot um, to get data. Um, we have another approach um, following what Sven Meyer was doing in Stuttgart, um, just instrumenting the human using an optic track to track positions and recording the capacitive readings at a range of different positions. Um, it's more challenging in this problem because it's a 3D space. And so it was typically what the, how this had been applied before was on a, a touch screen where you had to actually be physically touching the screen, but at different angles. Doing that at a range of heights as well as angles adds to the complexity significantly. Um, we also looked at using electrostatics models. Um, so we, we had a uh, first principles physical model of the electrostatic response. And that was a finite element approach and it took about 80 seconds on a high powered computer to simulate one pose. So it's not something you could use in real time. However, you can use a neural network to model that. So you can just represent the, um, the you generate a large set of examples and then get the neural network to emulate it. And then that can work real time so you could have that running two and a half million times faster. So neural networks are emulating time-consuming simulation to something that's going to become more and more common in the future, I think. Okay, so let's adapt the image that we saw earlier. So now we're going to take a bunch of finger poses as the truth. Um, so they're, they're going to be represented as X, Y, Z, uh, pitch and yaw. We can't detect roll animals properly with this one, so we're not using roll. And we predict the experimental measurements that we would see. And the, the electrostatic model is used as the example of domain expertise. And then we generate a large number of possible finger poses that we want the um, inverse uh, system to learn to, to invert. And we predict what the outputs would be with the multi-fidelity model. And we run there and that loop until everything is converged. And then once we're given a new measurement, we can generate uh, a sample of poses that will work with them. So just to give you some examples, here we see on the top row the observed sensor data, um, and then we've got the simulation data for that. So this is the electrostatic simulation, the first principles one. 
and our emulation of that one. So you can see the emulation is doing a pretty good job of being the same as the simulation. The simulation you can see has got some elements of the truth, you know, it's roughly in the right place, but it's not getting the richness and complexity of the real sensor data. So it's not, you know, the physical prior knowledge we had is not good enough at the start. Here we show what's happened once you train the variational autoencoder on it. So the top row is observed examples, then you've got the mean predictions. And each of the next rows are samples drawn from that. So you're averaging these to get this. And you can see that there's still some improvement that could be had on the, none of the samples, they look a bit more noisy than the mean um, or than the observed data, but the, the mean and the observed data are actually pretty close. And you can see that these are quite messy, complicated things here. So although you're pointing, you can see that the sensor is picking up some of the rest of the hand as well. Um, and so trying to process these with simple thresholds is not going to be a straightforward task. And in real world practice, that's also important because somebody may be focusing on the tip of their finger, but their thumb may end up being closer to the screen than um, the tip of the finger, even though they don't realize it. Okay, so how well does it do? If things were perfect, these would be nice clean diagonal lines. So the less noise, vertical noise you have, the better. And the more things are aligned, then that's true. So that's true x against predicted x, true height against predicted height. And what was interesting is here, even at four centimeters away from the screen, although it's starting to deviate a bit, it's doing a good job. And What's new with this method is we're getting good yaw predictions. Nobody else has been able to get good yaw predictions from capacitor screens. Uh, pitch has been done to some degree before. Some of the larger errors here are likely to be happening at higher Z values um, because it's getting a much weaker signal now there. Right, okay. And so here are some summary statistics showing how the um, as you move away from the uh, surface, you're going to have gradually increasing error rates um, in the different signals. Uh, but the, these are, I think the, the previous best results were about uh, 20, 25 degrees for your. Okay, and then some time series just to show you how the predictions are changing over time. And, um, and the uncertainty. So one of the nice things about taking the sampling approach is you can predict the, the uncertainty in the system. Um, so if you want to see the impact of the simulation data on the process, you can compare an approach that only used experimental data with one that combines the method we're proposing that combines experimented and simulated data. And you see that the, the error is significantly larger for smaller training sets and only starts to join up as you get um, significantly more data. So the, the Vici approach can work much better with smaller amounts of data. Okay. Um, and here's another example where we're uh, looking at the impact of the training set size and, and the inversion. The blue line here is showing how the forward model improves. So you see the forward model gets good reasonably early on. Um, at the start, both methods are pretty hopeless with small amounts of data, but Vici improves much more rapidly and it takes a lot longer for the direct approach to catch up with much more data. Okay, and so if we have this sort of model working, we can use it in lots of ways to better understand the richness of touch input as well as new explicit mechanisms for um, interaction with 3D movements in the screen. So that's one example. Another one is the Sony radar. So this is um, a sensor that's been in the Google products since the Pixel 4 phone which had it. So it's a 60 gigahertz radar that you can use for gestural interaction. It's also in some of the Google Home speakers and um, thermostats for detecting where people are. So here the, the chat task is that you're moving your hand near uh, a sensor. Uh, the forward model is going to be predicting the complex range Doppler response of the radar. And you'd like to use an inverse model to go back to understanding what the hand pose was. So as we did before, we were going to try and put some sensors on the hand and represent that in some sort of a model. 
So we have, again, OptiTrack da um, data, much as we had before. Um, we sampled that and we, we can create uh, data where we know what the hand pose was for the radar um, readings that were recorded. Okay, so we've got the X, Y, Z positions of each of these points. We therefore have, can have a time series as somebody moves their hand in front of the radar. And we can couple that to um, the amplitudes and the phase representations of the radar responses. And in the same structure as we've been showing before, now you've got your full hand motion coming in. You have a we have a simulation model um, that uses simple reflective um, bodies to predict what the the radar response would be, and we can learn the residuals uh, with our variational model based on experimental data. But there's a huge you know you can imagine that the the number of features that we could have in the radar response are huge uh, for a relatively simple system. So getting complete coverage with experimental data is going to be tricky. The inverse of, uh, model is trained in the same way as before. We uh, can put a bunch of hand poses in, predict what the radar response would be and optimize the, the inverse model. So just to give um, an example that the sort of first principles physics simulation just um, has a simple segmented model of the hand. It has reflecting bodies and um, it's trying to generate a simulated result that is as close to the experimental data as possible. So here we've got the, the range data, here we've got the velocity data. And it's not perfect, but it's, it's not a million miles away. Um, so we now want to do the same process before. So this uh, first principle simulation runs, provides context for an autoencoder, and we combine the, the hand motion positions with the as inputs, and we're trying to predict the radar response. So this is our forward model. And you can see some of the data. So this is what the, the sort of stuff the systems learn. Different hand movements, you see some lateral movements on the left and fingers waggling on the right, and you get the radar response. So we're trying to make sense out of this. Okay. Um, so here you can see some of the results. So the true observed data is this, we have a simulated model, and then our multi-fidelity model on the right is showing our combination of uh, experimental data and simulated data to try and predict what the radar would see. And um, so this, if we'd been sticking with the simulated model, we'd have the middle one and the multi-fidelity model, you know, by eye looks a lot better in terms of fit to the, the range and the velocity data. And if you actually look at the root mean squared error, then the multi-fidelity one is significantly lower than the simulation. So that's suggesting we're on the right track. Okay, so the, the whole system, when you put it together, starts to look a bit more funky. Um, and it's sort of reminding you that one of the major steps forward in machine learning in recent years has been that the software engineering in PyTorch and um, TensorFlow is making it feasible to build systems like this, which would have been a lot more painful 20 years ago. Um, and we have a number of different, so these are the conditional encoders, encoders and decoders involved in this. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through the, the gory details of that, but uh, it gives you a sense of the complexity of the, the system that you can put together. And the, the challenge is to see what sort of gestures we can detect and how can we do that reliably. So quite often designers will want to propose a particular style of gesture because they think it's a good idea for interaction. But we need to know how reliably can our sensor plus signal processing inversion get to a clear finger pose associated with that. And that's part of the challenge. Um, and here, what you can see is the uncertainty of our final models. So you can see what might you might have thought that 
you know, moving your hand like this was simpler than, than moving your fingers like that. But you can see the, in blue the true data and then a cloud of colour points showing samples from the model. And although they're not a million miles away, the spatial properties of the radar are not great um, laterally speaking. And so you see a cloud of uncertainty as it moves around. And that would be useful information to feed into somebody wanting to design a gesture recognition system. Whereas the the vertically, the ones where you, you've got the, the velocity towards the device tend to be doing better. There's less uncertainty about the pose. And that's again, useful information for a classification system. Okay. Um, and again, here we show that the, if we only use experimental data, we would typically have done worse than having the combination with the simulated data. Uh, here's some time series predictions um, where you can see for the motion involved what the uncertainty was like and we're plotting uncertainty as a time series. So that's one finger moving. And, and here's a, a different finger moving and looking at the ground truth in blue compared to our reconstruction and the uncertainty on it. Okay, so oh, I've actually managed to stick to the half hour. I was worried I wouldn't. Um, so we've been testing the approach in a number of application areas from computational imaging to radar. Um, we think that complex input sensing problems in HCI can be addressed systematically with this approach. So um, at the moment, people have been trying to use ad hoc techniques coupled with a bit of standard signal processing to do input sensing in HCI. And I think this gives you a more systematic way where you can combine all the prior knowledge you have about the physics with actual experimental data. And you can use that to augment the, you know, using the forward model can help you augment the inverse problem and give you a system that gives you an uncertain feedback. So you can, you've got the raw material to work with uncertainty in your downstream gesture recognition tasks. We think it's likely to be more valuable in, in complex high dimensional sensing problems where conventional methods would struggle to, to get enough training data to robustly invert the system. And you can see that with, with problems like the radar. Um, so with the capacitive touch, because we only had a 10 by 16, although we were better, we could probably have got something uh, going because our, our previous methods we'd been just using direct models with machine learning and it, it, it wasn't as good as what we had but it was still able to do something but as the number of dimensions increases the the need for data increases exponentially and if you want to read a bit more about these um, the basic ideas were presented in the journal of machine learning research last year and we've got a a recent um, archive draft on the capacitive work. Great. Okay. Auntie's giving an excuse for bailing out. Right. Anybody else? Good questions? So great. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. So yes, I said now we have good time for questions and discussion. So you can either yeah, raise hand or write in the chat, but please go ahead, Steve. Hi, uh, thank you. That was really, really exciting. Um, I'm curious if you could just give a bit more detail on like what's your training objectives? Like you have a quite a complex architecture. How do you train that? Do you have like a joint objective for everything or how do you actually manage to fit that? So we, we, we separate it into different processes. So there was the cross entropy term that's being minimized in the forward model. Um, so if we um, let's see, just Yeah, so you, you basically, you know, you, you start off just uh, 
so you 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 you're basically first of all trying to get um, the cross entropy minimized. So let's just so you 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 you've got your set of samples and you're you're trying to make your network um, able to to minimize that. You you've built you first build the forward model, and then you put that. So let's just see. Let's go to the, this process. So you you have a you first of all uh, you've got your first principles model. You then uh, train your your forward model to completion. So that's a sort of standard um, conditional VAE um, learning process. Once you've got that, that slots in as a pre-trained element and you use that to augment the training data to train the inverse problem, which is again, it's a straightforward um, variational autoencoder task. And then you can use that to draw samples. So, um, and you can have, you know, so for example, all the standard things of searching over different model spaces and so on, you know, so if you want to optimize the numbers of um, layers, the number of units, the types of units and so on, you can put that into a Bayesian optimization framework around that. So we, we would optimize these structures to, um, uh, maximize the elbow you know, on, on these. So it's using a variational approach and uh, doing the, the standard the standard sorts of things there. If I could just follow up quickly on that, like how, how much effect did like things like what's your architecture and so on, how much effect did they have? Uh, so it, it, it will, that will vary from problem to problems. For some of them, it was fairly robust. For some, you'd have nasty mode collapse problems every now and again. Um, initially, I had been fiddling around with convolutional nets on the um, um, capacitive problem. And when, when I was just using standard um, direct inversion with a, a neural net. For the, the CVAE, it ended up being straight, more straightforward just to go for a bog standard set of linear uh, layers, so dense layers, uh, rather than trying to have complicated sets of convolutional features because it's a relatively low dimensional problem. You know, it's 10 by 16. It's not, the benefits of convolutional methods aren't really kicking in and also, um, the locality issue is, is complicated here because there are edge effects. So it's, it's not really the, this, the, the benefits of convolutional methods were not particularly apparent. So just using dense, dense layers and then optimizing the number and the uh, size of them was the, the way I found got best results. Um, as you get more complicated things. So for example, we've been generalizing it to multi-user cases and trying to learn because different shapes of finger will have different responses. So you then get a multimodal response for any finger, depending on which user it is. And um, depending on how you set that up, that can have more mode collapse problems. Um, but also as you get more data, you've got you're a bit more solidity for the, the system to work with. You've, you've got a clearer embedding space. So um, I think it's much the same as all of these things. There can be some fiddly bits, but it's often surprisingly robust. Okay, thanks. As I see no other hands up yet, so I could take the opportunity and ask. So a, a bit of follow-up question. So how sensitive is your model also for the sensor? So that you have collected the training data with. So what, what if you change kind of like the individual of, of the same model or, or if you completely change, for example, the camera model for doing the inference? Yes, yeah, so one of the interesting things um, is how much can we, <coughs> how much can we use this approach to, to make ourselves more robust? Um, so, we're, we've been looking at what happens when different individuals use the system, so that's one source of variability. Um, if you were uncertain as to the properties of the, the, the camera, then you know you could part of that could be represented by uh, 
having a number of modes in the forward model where you simulate different cameras and say, well, there's uncertainty as to which camera was used. And so the, the same target could generate different responses. So uh, I think what's nice about it is it would let you separate out the modeling effort. If you change the sensor, then the primary effect is going to be on the forward model. And then you can use your updated forward model to improve your inverse process. So I think that this decoupling of the two parts of the machine learning process is quite well suited to that sort of problem. OK, great. Thank you. So we still have some time for, for questions. OK, yes, Aurelien, please. Uh, yes, I, I was wondering, like in terms of uh, application context, uh, so you talk about like uh, like a touch screen, mm -hmm. but did you did you try like over context of application of this same um, uh, technique of decoupling like uh, forward and, and uh, inverse? Yeah, so so the, well, uh, we we had some. Um, examples in the GMLR paper, which were purely physics. So we've got their you know, computational imaging problems. Um, and we've, you know, today I've been documenting the capacitive touch and the radar. So they're there, the sensors are quite different. And we also did an, uh, another one where we used radar to predict um, depth images. And the Vici approach was quite good because in that problem you if you have uh, if you don't know the direction somebody was uh, in you you could see an image and there would be um two possible places where somebody could reappear and the vici approach lets you sample both of them in there rather than saying that you've got some sort of an, an average uh, in between them so that's quite nice um so yes, yeah, so it's been we've got a variety of computational imaging tasks and um, and then the the interaction ones so far. We also have a paper that's coming out in Nature Physics um, in the next few days where we used it for gravitational waves. Um, so we've been basically at the moment um, gravitational wave uh, physics requires very large Bayesian models to ch chunder away for. Um, several hours and we were able to recreate those models types of models to run in milliseconds and the goal for that is that if you detect a gravitational wave event what you would like to do is turn your telescopes the radio frequency telescopes to that part of the sky to try and get as much information as you can in the aftermath of the blast um, so then we together with our colleagues in physics in glasgow we used these sorts of models to represent the uh, the existing Bayesian models, but run much more efficiently. And that's appearing in the December Nature Physics um, uh, magazine, not magazine, journal. Uh, the physicists call them journals. We computer scientists call them magazines because they're such short papers. But... Okay, yeah, it looks uh, yeah, it looks super great. Like to yeah, to be able to apply the same technique from uh, like. Uh... Yeah, so it's self different context, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hey, please, so I'm go ahead. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, my question was more of like, uh, just how we conduct science sometimes. Yeah, it's very quiet. Can you maybe speak up a little bit? <laughs> yeah, can you make it a bit louder? Is it better now? Still quite quiet, but uh, try, try and speak up and I'll... I'll... Okay, I think this should be better now. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the talk. I was just wondering if um, uh, you have any comments about using some setups like this for scientific discovery, where a lot of times um, new things are found due to something that was unexpected. So when we have models that we kind of believe in, um, would that be biasing the kind of data we? be then gathering. You could you could wrap this into the scientific modeling process. So for example, with the, the multi-fidelity model here, if 
everything we understand is embodied in this observation model. So that's our existing state of the art in physics. The, if our neural network is having to do an awful lot of work to improve that, that's telling us we don't understand everything. Okay, so, um, and this can in the end just ignore this. If it finds that the, the data is behaving very differently from the model, then it will just not use this data as inputs uh, if they don't help it predict things. So the more that the forward model is having to build on top of that, that's telling us we don't understand things. And, and then there's not everything in the forward model will mass matter for inversion. So there's also an interesting challenge there. So um, getting back to the, the earlier question about how, you know, how do we model things? So one potential disadvantage of this approach is that we put a lot of, we might be putting a lot of effort into modeling bits in the forward process, which end up not having an effect on the inversion. Um, you know, so there, maybe this really depends on accuracy in some bits of this, uh, which wouldn't have as big an effect on that. So, you know, you could imagine doing the, the full process in a more joined up way. But at the moment, we've gone for the modularity of first model this, get that as good as possible, then use that here. Um, but you could imagine a joint optimization of, of both, both sets. Um, it just makes the process a bit more complex, the workflow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry we are now starting to run out of the time, but, but thank you so much for the very interesting presentation and also for everyone for good questions and then discussion. So we will then see you again next week at the machine learning coffee seminar. And if anybody wants to talk, as I say, I'll be here till the 5th of December, so feel free to email, email me. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.